just coming up to three o'clock UK time and uh, as opposed to what my video shows it is not a blue sky and background in the UK it's stormy it's windy it's getting dark it's not too bad it's about 12 degrees but um, not a place to be outside and uh, and sunning yourself so what we're going to do is spend um, the the next 45 minutes um, talking about inflammatory joint disease in particular rheumatoid arthritis I'm a, a, a a consultant rheumatologist at a hospital called Ashford St Peter's Hospital which is in Surrey just to the south of London uh, for those of you not in the UK it's um, about 30 to 40 miles south of London it's a large district general hospital and I've been a rheumatologist there for nearly 30 years so I've got the credentials to talk to you about rheumatoid arthritis I'm not going to make it too complex I'm going to identify the the parts of the disease that would be useful for non-specialist rheumatologists to know about and there'll be an opportunity uh, for some questions so I'm going to come off my video and hopefully everybody can already see the um, the shared talk so uh, I will open the chat box in case anyone's having any difficulties and you're all muted by um, our moderator so welcome um, I'm going to start with a case and I've got another case and we'll orientate some of the discussions around the case so if you want to get your huge brains working on um, what you're dealing with uh, this is a relatively straightforward case a Mrs uh, PH who's a 38 year old uh, lady born in the UK um, lived in the UK all of her life as a mother and a wife and works as a school cook she's normally pretty well she has a busy active life she's got two children she looks after she works most days of the week sort of three to four days not all day but um, it's pretty much a full-time job she started to develop early morning joint stiffness in the hands and by early morning we mean at the time that you wake up and normally for somebody who's busy and working it's around 6 or 6 30 and it's a time that is important in rheumatology because it's a time that inflammation expresses itself at its greatest degree and that the reason for that is because we run a diurnal rhythm for our own steroids so we are at our lowest uh, last thing at night and first thing in the morning and because our natural steroids that we produce from our adrenal glands are very good at helping inflammation if we have a lot of inflammation we're at our lowest steroid level in the early mornings and it's the time it expresses itself most um, there wasn't any swelling but she couldn't make a a fist on waking up her hands were stuck in a position where she wanted to close them up but they weren't able to suggesting that there was a combination of both joints and tendons uh, causing problems and she didn't do much about it because she's busy she didn't have time to start messing around going to the doctor or worrying about it but it gradually worsened over a month and along came some swelling so quite often people are aware of swelling not only when joints hurt but when they look as though they're slightly bigger than they should be but in particular when rings on the ring fingers don't uh, fit and her rings started not to fit and she had to take them off then her feet started to hurt and there was a sort of variability in things at first one day would be bad one day would be better and she couldn't really find a pattern to it didn't seem to be weekdays when she was working that it was worse or weekends when she was resting um, and usually she was better by around the sort of 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and because she was a school cook most of her work was actually done around lunchtime so she could manage and this is where her hands were when they'd started to swell and um, hopefully you can see my pointer what you've got in a hand is you've got wrists then you've got metacarpophalangeal joints you've got proximal interphalangeal joints and you've got distal interphalangeal joints and what you can see here is the majority of her swelling is across the proximal interphalangeal joints you can imagine if she's wearing a ring on her left hand um, ring finger she wouldn't be able to wear that because it would get tight with the swelling she's also if you look carefully got a bit of swelling on her right wrist as well <clears throat> 
she then starts to feel tired, unreasonably tired, and finds herself not feeling refreshed when she gets up in the morning. She wasn't sleeping too badly, and she was getting just as much sleep as she, sh she should be, but she was feeling as though, you know, that feeling when you've had an infection or influenza or COVID, you feel tired, uh, unreasonably tired, and she was starting to feel that. She was then finding that her knees and her shoulders started to hurt. And don't forget, this isn't an elderly person. This is a 38-year-old fit and well um, mother of two in full-time work. And she started to struggle with her activities of daily living. She essentially couldn't do all the busy things that she was uh, meant to be doing around the house, including being the primary carer for her children. Uh, and everything started to then say, look, there's something really unusual um, going on. This is not what her friends were experiencing at 38. So, so when we look at the diagnosis, I'm not going to get you to necessarily do anything more than self-reflect on what you think you're dealing with. The way you orientate yourself is you, you, you say, all right, the demographic, we're talking about a female in her 30s um, without any predisposing illness. We're talking about relatively rapid onset of swelling in joints that are associated with inflammatory joint disease in the hands. And we're talking about polyarthralgia, so across many joints. And we're talking about early morning stiffness and swelling. So it's got to be inflammatory. So your diagnosis is inflammatory polyarthritis. Poly meaning many, arthritis meaning swollen joints. So it's a pretty descriptive term. And what you're interested in is just as much the inflammatory polyarthritis as to what the cause of the inflammatory polyarthritis is. And you've got then to cross-reference to a 38-year-old um, woman. We don't know whether she's um, a Caucasian. We don't know whether she's somebody whose family or antecedents came from overseas. We don't know whether she's Asian, she's African. We know nothing about that. So we have to say, all right, look, we've got a 38-year-old who's developed inflammatory polyarthritis. It's got to be rheumatoid arthritis at the top of the pile. But alternatively, you've got several other things you can think about. So that there's an inflammatory polyarthritis called reactive arthritis that comes on 7 to 21 days after an infection. And we've been seeing quite a lot of that around COVID and as a very immunogenic, a very immunological infection. And we've been seeing it after COVID vaccine and after COVID itself. Um, we don't have any idea as to whether this woman had an infection 7 to 21 days earlier. You'd definitely be wanting to ask her that. You want to check that it wasn't a reactive arthritis. You'd want to know whether she's got any family history and in particular whether she's got any other illnesses that might predisposed to arthritis, in particular whether she's got any skin psoriasis, which can sometimes only be found around the margins of her scalp or on her elbows or knees. So you'd be asking her about that and you'd also be asking her whether she'd ever had any inflammatory bowel disease, so things like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, because they can predispose to inflammatory polyarthritis. I have to say both the reactive arthritis and the um, Crohn's ulcerative colitis tend to affect the larger joints more than the smaller joints. And hers was small joint symmetrical polyarthritis. So our investigations, well, we're quite interested in seeing what blood tests show because we realize that if we're trying to make a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, we need to know whether the antibodies that are sometimes associated with rheumatoid arthritis are positive. So in particular, an autoantibody called rheumatoid factor and a rather more up-to-date one, which we'll talk about later called anti-CCP antibody, which is more specific and more sensitive than rheumatoid factor. So when you see it, it usually means something. But don't forget, only half the people who present with rheumatoid arthritis are seropositive. In other words, have positive serological tests when you test them for it. 
And whilst you were doing that, you'd also probably, just as a side issue, just make sure she didn't have something a little more unusual like gout. I say unusual because gout often doesn't affect multiple joints and often doesn't affect women as much as men and often comes out with a single joint and a past history. But you'd check the uric acid and you'd also want to check her anti-nuclear antibody because sometimes you see inflammatory polyarthritis coming as an accompaniment of lupus. So if you have that set of very basic antibodies and blood tests, including ESR and CRP to look for uh, inflammation, then you're doing pretty well. Would an x-ray help? No, it wouldn't because it's too early in the course of the disease to show any joint damage. And we'll see later that rheumatoid can cause joint damage by causing erosions. Uh, we also wouldn't do an ultrasound because we can see she's got an inflammatory joint. So a number of people have ultrasound in their early arthritis clinics and would routinely do an ultrasound. I wouldn't be sending her for an ultrasound out of my clinic because I know she's got inflammation. And am I worried about this lady? Well, yes, I am. I'm not worried that she can't cope. She's strong, brave and young. I am worried because this is an urgent uh, need to get her inflammation settled because if we don't, she can start to damage her joints at a very early stage of arthritis. And believe it or not, these sort of presentations can reasonably be considered to be a rheumatological emergency because within a few months, you can start to see erosions develop and joints changing shape and small muscles of the joints wasting and people developing the accompaniments of rheumatoid arthritis, such as osteoporosis and even cardiovascular disease, which we'll talk about. So, so urgent, but then I am a rheumatologist and I realize those things, but you're now starting to orientate around the fact that actually rheumatoid arthritis is an issue and you need to be starting to recognize it and treat it. So what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at the cardinal signs of inflammation. So pain, well, anything that's inflammatory was usually going to cause pain unless your pain threshold's very high. Swelling, which can either be visible or can be detected if it's debatable with an ultrasound scan. An ultrasound um, is used, color Doppler ultra ultrasound is used frequently now in the rheumatology world. Um, a, because it's fun to use, and B, because it can detect inflammation when apparently inflammation isn't there clinically. It's probably at its least useful when you've got clinical inflammation and you can tell it without the ultrasound. Heat, well, yes, that's a reasonable cardinal sign of inflammation, but rarely will you make a diagnosis of inflammation by the temperature of hands and joints and feet. And once upon a time, people did thermographs, which were ways of looking to see whether our joints were hot and red. We don't do that anymore. And redness isn't a great sign either. But loss of function is, and especially for her, for example, she started to uh, lose the ability to close her hands and make a fist early in the morning, well before you saw the visual inflammation. So you've got pain, swelling, uh, loss of function, and especially early morning stiffness, which is important. So in our differential diagnosis, we're talking about trying to elicit the things that would point us towards the differentials we've already talked about. So take a good history, um, small or large symmetrical joint spinal involvement, which is interesting because rheumatoid arthritis doesn't involve the spine, but some of the other arthritides um, do. So we tend to call them spondyloarthropathies, spondyle being Greek for vertebral body or backbone, and arthritides meaning something's wrong with your joint. So, so it means there's something wrong with your spine and your joint, and that tends to guide you towards the seronegative arthropathies such as psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, ankylosing spondylitis, things that can have peripheral joint involvement together with the spine. And the symmetrical side of it tends to guide you towards rheumatoid and away from 
things like psoriatic arthritis, which tend to be less symmetrical and more one joint here and one joint there. So we've talked about what it could be. Could it be anything else? Well, do you know, in older people, you can get an inflammatory osteoarthritis that can really mirror or mimic rheumatoid arthritis. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but not in a 38-year-old. However, 38-year-olds can have crystal arthropathy, and we've already talked about gout sometimes being symmetrical and small joint, but not very often. But there is another crystal arthritis called calcium pyrophosphate crystals, or CPPD, and they can um, occur in flares where many joints are affected, often their hands, often their wrists and fingers. And even young people can get calcium pyrophosphate arthropathy, especially if they have iron storage disorders. And if I see somebody who I don't think has rheumatoid, but has flares of small joint inflammation, then I will often do a ferritin test on them to check that they don't have an overload of iron and a condition called hemochromatosis, which is a condition where iron is laid down in a number of organs of the body, in particular the liver, and where you have to treat it with venesection to reduce the iron load. So yes, you can have young people with calcium pyrophosphate arthritis and hemochromatosis, but you start to get a little bit rarer then. So, so let me tell you about Another person at the other end of life, an 81-year-old uh, Mr. GF, who's a retired bricklayer, he's given his joints a bit of um, hard work over his life. He's been a manual laborer all his life. He was uh, 71 when he retired, so he'd worked from the time he was 16 all the way to 71 as a bricklayer. He was pretty well. He'd had a small myocardial infarction in his 70s and was on some standard cardiac medication, a, a, a statin, a, a bit of bisoprolol beta blocker and an antihypertensive. Um, he was known to have osteoarthritis of the hands and had had bony swellings of his hands for some time. But here he was getting his third COVID vaccine last year, which was a Pfizer vaccine. And within 14 days of that, he had an acute swelling of his hands. Now, you're going to say, well, OK, has he got early morning stiffness? Yes, he has. Has he got swelling of the DIP joints versus the PIP and MCP? Because if he gets DIP joint swelling, it would guide you towards inflammatory osteoarthritis. But he didn't. He's already got the little bony swellings of his DIP, the end tip joints of his fingers. But most of this guy's inflammation came where he didn't have osteoarthritis in his hands on the MCP joints, the first set of knuckles from the wrist upwards. And he started to develop painful feet and real discomfort walking. So he's a bricklayer. He didn't do very much about it. But when two or three weeks went past, because he thought it was something to do with his vaccine, he still had the inflammation and he sought some help. So here are his hands up and the top, uh, where you can see the Hebedens nodes of the end joints, the DIP joints of the fingers. You can see that the MCP joints aren't affected or swollen. And you can see there's a bit of fiddliness going on with activities of daily living. But this is him when he's got his inflammation. The MCP joints, the wrists, the hands, they all start to become very painful. This isn't just awkwardness. This is acute uh, inflammation going on. And in fact, they puffed up an awful lot uh, more than that and really started to get swollen. So he had some investigations, uh, slightly reluctantly with his GP, who thought, well, it's probably just um, COVID vaccine anyway. What could he expect at the age of 81? Um, but his acute phase responses, his ESR was 45. You're allowed an ESR a little bit higher uh, to be normal when you're older, but 45 still a little bit elevated. And and I normally reckon any CRP above 20 is telling you something. And, and he had a CRP of 32. So his GP also was just wondering whether he might have 
another inflammatory condition because he presented with a family history of rheumatoid and his rheumatoid factor was positive at 52. Uh, he didn't get a CCP antibody done, just had his rheumatoid factor. And he didn't have any imaging of his joints as he'd already had uh, x-rays showing that he had osteoarthritis a year or two ago and no ultrasound needed to be ordered when he came to see rheumatology because again his joints were pretty visibly swollen on the MCP and PIP joints. So what's his diagnosis? Well his diagnosis is one of two or three things. So if you go back to the story, well it seemed to come on 14 days after a COVID vaccine. So it might be a reactive arthritis, which you remember comes on 7 to 21 days after an infective insult. And it doesn't have to be the active infection that causes the insult. It can be the vaccination that stimulates the immune system and causes the insult. So he might have a COVID vaccine stimulated polyarthritis, but his rheumatoid factors positive. Well, rheumatoid factors very sensitive, but non-specific. And in a test that is sensitive, it will detect it if it's there. So there are very few false negatives, but it sometimes over detects it. So there are sometimes false positives. So you see a rheumatoid factor where there's no rheumatoid arthritis, because you can sometimes inherit from your family the ability to uh, develop rheumatoid factor antibodies, which are immunoglobulins that are raised against the body's own immunoglobulins. So they're a sort of idiotype antibody. So he might have a reactive arthritis after Pfizer, but Pfizer might also, the vaccine might also have stimulated a, a new onset inflammatory arthritis such as rheumatoid. So rheumatoid's a possibility with a trigger of the COVID vaccine. Post-COVID vaccine reactive arthritis is a possibility. But as he's older and he's got known inflammatory osteoarthritis, it may be that what he's actually got is a flare of inflammatory osteoarthritis due to crystals, either calcium pyrophosphate crystals or hydroxyapatite crystals. Hydroxyapatite, A-P-A-T-I-T-E, appetite is a sort of debris type crystal that happens around damaged joints. So it's possible that he had that. But actually, the way this looks, it looks as though the COVID vaccine has come along and triggered the onset of uh, acute inflammatory um, rheumatoid arthritis. And the point being that this can happen of anyone of any age, especially an 81 year old who's never had any particular joint trouble in the past except uh, osteoarthritis. So the treatment, well, the treatment's sort of similar and we'll talk about treatment, but just a take home message for older onset um, patients above the age of 75 who get acute rheumatoid, that it's incredibly sensitive to steroids normally and normally all you have to do is give a little bit of a booster of steroid, either go up to a dose that's a little bit um, uh, larger than a low dose. So either start at 20 or use an intramuscular depomedrone steroid injection. So a little booster into the bottom to get the arthritis under control and then rapidly reduce the dose of tablet steroid down to five milligrams, but keep the five milligrams going. And often, as opposed to the patients in their 30s and 40s that need really active treatment, often you can keep the whole thing in control with just five milligrams of steroids. So it's an extremely rewarding disease to treat in uh, older age. And it's a mistake to go straight towards the stronger anti-rheumatics at that stage. So we're going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology, a little bit about the diagnosis and presentation, which we already have. We're going to be talking a bit about the management of rheumatoid and a little bit about the patient. So here's a, a Van Gogh picture of um, his postman, Joseph Roulin. And if you look carefully at Joseph Roulin's fingers, he has got the typical characteristic deformities of rheumatoid arthritis. In his right hand, he's got wasting of the small muscles. He's also got something called 
uh, Boutonnier deformity on his index finger where the PIP joint becomes flexed and the DIP hyperextended. So he's got the same uh, deformities there. So very, very much Van Gogh looking very carefully and being fascinated by the deformities that um, his postman has. And of course, in them days, you watched the natural history of these diseases rather than had anything in particular to treat them with. So he's obviously still working as a postman. Well, good for him. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disorder. In the olden days, when I started uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, study and treatment, we saw an awful lot more people with an awful lot of systemic accompaniments of rheumatoid. We saw patients with rheumatoid eye disease. Um, here's somebody with uh, little corneal ulcers because they've got dry eyes, but they've also got an iritis um, that can accompany rheumatoid. Here's somebody with lung fibrosis, which can accompany rheumatoid. And rheumatoid can affect all the sides of the heart. Not only can it cause myo muscle situs, myositis, and more likely pericarditis, but it can also lead, if it's untreated, to premature atherosclerosis or furring up of the arteries. So an arthritis becomes an arteritis. And in fact, it's not quite that. It's not quite the arteritis. It's that we have known for some while that coronary vessel disease, atherosclerosis, starts its life as an inflammatory condition. And you can use a high sensitivity CRP test to assess people who might be in the process of developing premature atherosclerosis. Whereas if you see overt inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid and lupus that aren't very well treated, they can go on to cause um, atherosclerosis. Now, Oddly enough, we see less of this sort of disease because probably we are treating more actively at an earlier stage of the disease or potentially perhaps what we're seeing is a, a shift in the nature of rheumatoid with time. But I like to think it's because of our treatments as much as um, the nature of the disease. So there are certain diagnostic criteria that help you to identify. Now, diagnostic criteria are okay for helping you to diagnose, but they're really most important in making sure when you're running a clinical trial, you're getting a homogeneous group of patients into it. So patients who truly have the same disease. So you'd be looking for morning stiffness, arthritis of more than three joints um, of the following ones, PIPs, MCPs, wrists, elbows, knees, ankles. You'd be looking at symmetrical involvement of the joints. You might be looking for rheumatoid nodules, which are little inflammatory soft tissue nodules that are sometimes attached to the periosteum below and quite often occur over extensor surfaces. So in particular, across the elbows and going down the forearm, and in particular, across the feet, under the feet or across the Achilles. Again, we don't see as much rheumatoid nodule arthritis now, and we don't know why we don't see it. You'd be looking at positive serology, and uh, some of the older criteria involve rheumatoid factor, and some of the newer ones involve C3P antibody. And we'd also be looking to see whether there were changes of um, periarticular osteopenia or decalcifying calcification adjacent to the joints or overt erosions, little um, bony burrowing away um, like a little creature's been burrowing into the uh, joint margins. And it's not little creatures, it's the inflammation that comes with synovitis causing the chemicals that destroy the bone and the synovium uh, developing across the, the joints and, and if it's not treated causing joint damage. So who gets this unpleasant disease? Well, anywhere between 1% and 3% of the UK population. So that's nearly as many people who, as have primary diabetes. 
Females three to one. So there's very clearly something about female genes or female hormone exposures. And we think it's probably as much the, the hormones because we see peak onset of rheumatoid relating to times of hormone change, such as puberty, pregnancy, and the menopause. And you can see people either developing the condition around those times or hopefully around the menopause losing the condition. You have some people who've never seen rheumatoid till the menopause and develop it after the menopause. So it's, it's an unpredictable uh, science looking at hormones and rheumatoid. And in fact, once upon a time, there was a vogue for doing clinical trials of HRT on females with um, rheumatoid. And we saw results that ranged from people getting much better to people who didn't respond to people getting much worse. So clearly it was having an effect on the joints, but not a predictable effect. Surprisingly, perhaps to some of you, the most frequent incidences between the ages of 30 and 45 uh, and uh, that lady of 38 therefore is peak on primary incidence. The cause isn't known but there's most definitely a genetic predisposition but it's 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 given by a series of HLA markers uh, in particular DRQ and DR beta markers that are quite commonly found and therefore you can't be attributing the development of the rheumatoid to the possession of the gene but you can say look these particular genes make it slightly more likely that given the wrong environmental trigger you can develop rheumatoid and those environmental triggers are the usual ones for developing autoimmune disease they tend to be uh, infection they tend to be hormonal they tend to be big shock emotion stuff like a bereavement. They tend to be post-traumatic, which again is probably mediated through shocks. So there's a number of things that can trigger these conditions that are lying there minding their own business as a vulnerability and suddenly they come out of hiding. Um, again, it might surprise you to know that a family history of rheumatoid is only found in about 30% of rheumatoid cases. So um, it's more likely that there isn't a family history. And if you don't treat people with rheumatoid in the olden days, my, it's absolutely not the case now, although it would be if we didn't treat early and acutely, 50% of people are no longer able to work after five years. This is a rapidly progressive and an unpleasant disabling disease if it's not treated. Pain, swelling, stiffness, we've done that. Now, we've also touched on fatigue, weight loss and fever because we're interested in the fact that these diseases are mediated via cytokines. Cytokines are the chemicals of inflammation that are produced by the cells that are stimulated by lymphocytes. So they're macrophages and monocytes and lymphocytes themselves all produce cytokines and the three main cytokines are IL-1, IL-6 and TNF and the reason I mentioned them is because they are the main cytokines against which the new therapeutic agents of the biologics are raised because they are most represented in an inflamed joint. If you take the fluid out of a joint and measure the cytokines you'll see raised IL-1, IL-6 and TNF and all of those cytokines are also represented in infections. So that's why when you have an active rheumatoid, you feel like you've got an active infection. You feel tired, you can lose weight, you can get feverish. Uh, all of those things happen when you've got an infection itself or when you've got a tumor. So you've got these things that are the systemic accompaniments of disease that don't mean you've got an infection. It just means you've got an inflammation. And here's a, a typical medium stage rheumatoid. You can see it's quite different from the early stage in that the established MCP joint inflammation that obviously hasn't been treated hugely well at the start because there's already a degree of subluxation or slight shift of one bone on another that make up the MCP or metacarphalangeal joints. There's also just a little bit of what's called ulna deviation, which is movement of the fingers towards the ulna side. And also on the little finger, something called swan necking, which is a flexion at the DIP and a hyperextension at the 
PIP as opposed to boutonnier, which is a flexion at the PIP and an extension. These are movements that joints prefer to go into because they're pulled by ligaments when the muscles can no longer hold them in uh, place because the small muscles of the hands have been got wasted. Now, the whole point in treating these things is to stop them getting to this sort of stage. And this is what happens within the joint. You've got a little capsule called the synovial membrane or capsule and the membrane lines the capsule and the fluid gets produced within the joint because the blood vessels in the capsule become more porous. The cytokines mean that the little vascular endothelial gaps or fenestrations get bigger and the fluid can move in from the blood. They're still not big enough to let the blood cells in so it's sort of serum fluid but slightly different because it's full of cytokines and you can then start to get damage to the joints erosion of the cartilage and little bony um, erosions as a result of joint damage and this is what a sort of panus or panus means cloak in greek and this is a cloak of synovial inflammation that is coating the joint and within the joint um, itself and is unpleasant and causes damage where it's adherent to the areas of the joint and needs to be treated. Hannus formation. And this is a biopsy of synovial hypertrophy within the panus. And this is an H and E stain, a hematoxylid and eosin, which means that uh, it's staining up the inflammatory cells and that a great big germinal center clusters of inflammation and the synovium is no longer two or three cells thick it's now got a great big sheet of unpleasant inflammation in um, and hence the reason the joints are swelling and these are erosions that have occurred around joints you really want to try and treat the disease well enough to stop the erosions. This, in fact, is slightly cheating. This is psoriatic arthritis. So you can see an erosion in the DIP joint where rheumatoid doesn't affect the DIP joints. But it's just to illustrate what erosions look like. And oddly enough, and this is something people don't fully understand, rheumatoid is symmetrical. And there have been some very interesting animal model studies to suggest that it may be symmetrical because of the nerve connections from one side to the other and the rheumatoid can occur on one side and the nerves get triggered and stimulated and it then develops on the other side and there are some animal models of induced inflammation uh, where you can induce inflammation in the paw of an animal and then you biopsy the opposite paw and you see inflammation occurring there but if you cut the nerves connecting the two pores, the one that is on the other side and doesn't have the stimulated inflammation, doesn't develop inflammation. So it's still relatively poorly understood, uh, the symmetrical side of it, but it's probably neurologically mediated. And you sometimes see um, humans who have a paralysis or a problem on one arm develop rheumatoid on the other and not on the arm that's paralyzed. So what are the poor prognostic indicators? Well, insidious polyarticular onset, which means slow and gradual, gradually spreading to the joints. And you could argue that that 38-year-old woman has a poor prognostic indicator, but she's not a male, so that means she has a slightly better prognostic indicator. Erosions by three years and functional disability at one year. That's pretty blooming obvious. It means that people haven't been treated well enough but also extra articular involvement such as eye or heart or lung are poor prognostic indicators. Now, the only ones you can usually measure at an early stage are the positivity of the autoantibodies. And you'll remember only 50% of patients with rheumatoid have positive rheumatoid factor or CCP. But if they have high levels of rheumatoid factor or positive CCP antibody, it is a poorer prognostic indicator for how the rheumatoid is going to fare. Now, we're very good at measuring things in medicine, and one of the things you measure in rheumatoid is something called the disease activity score, which is a 
mathematical composite of four measurable things. The number of tender joints, which is a very objective um, view of joints, and they can be tender depending how hard you press. So you have to try and have a sort of uniform pressure rather than just squeeze them till they, they yelp. Numbers of swollen joints, and you'll notice these are 28 joints, so they're only counting the joints of the um, ankles above. The feet themselves don't count uh, as markers because it's very hard sometimes to differentiate between rheumatoid and osteo feet. Number of swollen joints, you ask the patient to globally assess their disease over the last week between 0 and 100 on a visual analog score and a measurable ESR or CRP. And they form a composite where by far and away the most important things that manage, sorry, um, I thought I'd turn the phone off, but I have now. Um, a disease activity score above 5.1 is active disease. A disease activity score of less than 2.6 is a disease in remission, hurrah. Um, and that's what you're really aiming for. You really don't want disease that's active and above 5.1. So these are complications which we'll skim through because you don't often see them. These are what we talked about as rheumatoid nodules on extensor surfaces. This is a complication where you see the skin involved with rheumatoid and different types of vasculitis in the um, I ignore that um, vasculitis in the skin. I'm just going to move that phone out. Apologies for that, best laid plans. Um, this is something called pyoderma gangrenosum, which is a, uh, a an inflammatory skin lesion that's very unpleasant indeed. They look like ulcers and they can be um, a part of a inflammatory process, not quite a vasculitis, but nearly. And, and then you've got the two complications of poorly controlled disease. You've got premature cardiovascular disease, which means when you're managing somebody with rheumatoid, you must make sure they have good control of their blood pressure and good control of their lipids and cholesterol. So you're talking about somebody um, who has to have an annual, probably with their primary care GP doctor, because the better they control the things they control, the less likely they are to get premature cardiovascular disease with their rheumatoid. And almost everybody with rheumatoid arthritis needs to have a regular bone density scan because there are two things that rheumatoid does to predispose to osteoporosis. One is using steroids and the other is uncontrolled rheumatoid disease. So here's the management part of it. Well, you've got to bring people on board and you've got to educate but not frighten because it's an extremely frightening disease to develop because everywhere you read about it, you read about this being a lifelong disabling disease and you've got to emphasize to people that A, it might not be lifelong because sometimes it isn't, but B, it's a disease that's very treatable and you can minimize or eliminate the chance of disability as long as you bring the patient on board and they're willing to take these medications. We can use local injections into the joints. We can also use injections into the buttock muscle of uh, steroid boosters to bring things under control and pretty much all rheumatoid injections are steroid injections. We have a number of drugs that we'll talk about and then we have the sort of um, health care um, help and advice that physiotherapists, occupational therapists and social services can give because sometimes there are periods of time where people have to be off work while their disease is managed properly, sometimes even off work for prolonged periods of time. So you've got to be aware that for some people, especially in these um, unpleasant financial days can be a big strain on people. So the goals of therapy are to reduce pain, obvious, reduce inflammation, obvious, prevent joint destruction, preserve joint function and bring the um, disease into remission. And this is how we do it as rheumatologists. We tend to use drugs that are able to 
immunosuppress or immunomodulate. Imagine rheumatoid is a disease where you're sitting in the rheumatoid car and you've got your foot on the accelerator and the engine is running very fast. That's active rheumatoid. And the idea of our drugs is to bring the foot off the accelerator and allow the car to go into idle mode. So we don't want the car to stall or stop. We want the car to run at a normal idling speed. So we're looking to immunomodulate an overactive immune system rather than immunosuppress. But sometimes our drugs achieve their immunomodulation by also immunosuppressing. And we've got some other immunological techniques for treating the disease. So, so our conventional drugs are drugs that were once upon a time used to prevent transplant rejection. So they were used to numb the immune response. So steroids we use a lot. Um, some of the drugs we used initially for treating rheumatoid, like cyclophosphamide, were very powerful immunosuppressants and caused lots of adverse effects such as increased infection rates, reduced blood counts, risks of tumours. We've moved away quite obviously from those sorts of drugs towards more immunomodulatory type drugs, things that achieve the same sort of outcome but do it in a slightly less harsh way. So steroids, were, believe it or not, were only um, artificially synthesised in rheumatoid in the late 1940s, so post-war. And it was through the 1950s that they were developed and they were remarkable to begin with. They transformed people's lives. And uh, the Nobel Prize was um, awarded to Philip Hench, um, who was the leader of this pack of scientists. He, in fact, was a, a clinician, um, an endocrinologist and rheumatologist. And he's developed steroids from adrenal, mashed up adrenal um, uh, tissue. And the steroids were non-purified, so they had wonderful, wonderful effects. But because their doses weren't controlled, they then had really dramatic adverse effects and people developed Cushingoid, um, fat deposition, uh, skin bruising, uh, vertebral uh, and bony fractures, diabetes, and all the things that come with steroid overdose. So it was only really later on in the late 50s and 60s where we could synthesize steroids in a laboratory environment that we could actually tell how much steroid was being given and therefore control the doses. Steroids are vital because they are first line use to bring diseases under control and they should then be supplemented and accompanied by something that's uh, non-steroid that allows steroids both to be um, reduced to low levels and even to be stopped. So these are a list of the long-term steroid side effects. The ones that possibly aren't realized quite as often are mood changes and depression they can happen a lot with steroids. We know about weight gain through increased appetite. We know about the potential for wound healing. Steroids can cause dermatitis as well as bruising. Um, they can cause blood pressure, stomach ulcers and osteoporosis and cataracts. So they're, they're powerful catabolic agents, but they are also extremely powerful and beneficial. So the clever money is on using steroids correctly. So we've got a number of what we call uh, synthetic disease modifying agents or synthetic DMARDs. And our mainstay one, the start, is methotrexate, which is one of the anti-metabolites. And it works by reducing cell proliferation and used in itself to be an anti-cancer drug. But actually now it's used in far, far smaller doses as an anti-metabolite. We use it as a weekly drug and we use it in doses from 15 to 30 milligrams, whereas it was used as a daily drug in chemotherapy regimes at 200 milligrams, so a very different use. Uh, our second one is usually leflunamide, and then we have a number of others we sometimes use, such as mycophenolate or azathioprine, but those tend to be our two conventional anti-metabolite DMARDs. We then have 
a number of other areas of the inflammatory cascade and cellular activation that we can interfere with. And as the science of cell activation has advanced, so we have developed a series of biologic therapies, which we call anti-cytokine antibodies or biologics. And the first one developed was against TNF. And you'll remember that IL-1, IL-6 and TNF are the most represented cytokines in the inflammatory cascade. So it was logical that they would be the ones that we would look at. And so we've developed now four or five different anti-TNFs. We've got drugs that antagonize IL-6 and IL-1, all of which are very active and useful in rheumatoid. We've also got a number of other targets we use, and there's a, a form of biologic therapy that depletes B cells, which is slightly strange because rheumatoid is a cell-mediated T cell immunological response, but the T cells are controlled by master B cells that are telling the T cells to get organized. They're like the generals in the piece. There are fewer of them around, but they have a marked influence on T cell biology. So you can deplete B cells with an anti-B cell antibody, such as one called rituximab that reduces the B cell activity and therefore control T cells. These drugs have been around for about 20 years. They are very expensive, but they're getting cheaper now because they're made through um, uh, non-branded companies and they are called biosimilars and they've dropped in price by about between a half and uh, uh, and two thirds and therefore they're much more accessible. Uh, people don't like switching from a branded to a generic biologic but they don't mind it when we tell them that it's much cheaper and we can therefore use it on a lot more people. So these are our anti-cytokines and you can see well just joining every day we've got anti-TNFs in Fliximab, Itanacept, Adalumimab. We've got anti-IL1s as Anakinra, IL6s as Tocilizumab and JAK inhibitors that aren't anti-cytokine at all but um, inhibit um, a pathway of inflammation called Janus kinase and hold out a lot of promise. At the moment we're finding them they're not quite as effective as the uh, cytokine antibodies, but they're being developed all of the time. And we've also got uh, B cell depletion therapy as rituximab. And there is a pathway for using these drugs where we can access them as long as we have been through at least two synthetic disease modifying agents. And therefore, we will often start treatment with steroids plus a combination of disease modifying agents. And if they don't work or are not tolerated, we can move straight through to the biologics. And quite often you'll find somebody on a combination of synthetic disease modifiers and biologics and maybe even a little bit of steroid together because what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to achieve this elusive disease activity score of less than 2.6 where you have very few tender joints or swollen joints, a low patient global assessment and no um, ESR uh, detectable. So we're nearly there now. I think I've come out from there. We'll go back to that. I hope you can still see it. Um, we've now got this elusive business of what it's like to have rheumatoid arthritis. It's all very well being a clever doctor with lists of of drugs, but it's quite frightening to be a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. So luckily in the UK, we have some extremely good patient resources. There's um, the National Rheumatoid Arthritis Society that have a, a, a newly diagnosed patient um, helpline where people get introduced to NRAS um, processes where they can uh, call in and get information on the disease. They can get, they can talk to people who've had the disease already and are being treated. They get reassurance from it rather than getting frightened by it. I don't know what it's like to have rheumatoid arthritis. I'm just a doctor. You have to really be a patient with rheumatoid to know. And we are, um, are very keen on developing our panel of 
patient experts who can not only help us des to design how we run the department, but can help us to design new treatments and treatment trials. Uh, but don't forget, going right back to the start, that rheumatoid arthritis is an emergency in many ways. It's an emergency to the patient because you've got the fear and the pain and you read about it being lifelong and loss of function and you've got the emergency to the doctor and to the joints because you want to avert the danger of joint damage that can help happen pretty pretty quickly in rheumatoid arthritis so one of the things we focus on is also to help our primary care doctors and those of you who are going to be primary care or our primary care doctors need to know how to recognize these conditions and not just to say well it's probably this, that, or the other, and uh, just why, why don't you just let it pass? And pretty much all of the departments in the UK have a pathway of referring through early inflammatory arthritis clinics where the hospital undertakes to see the patient quicker than a routine appointment, which is two to three months down the line after referral. And often early inflammatory clinics will get people booked in with within one or two weeks from referral. So that's um, your uh, talk on uh, rheumatoid arthritis. I will um, stop the share if I can. Might not be able to. There we go. Stop the share. And I will hopefully be able to start the video where I'll be there. So here's me again. Um, uh, thank you all for, uh, for listening. Um, we have gone on just a minute or two longer than I thought, but then I'm always like that. But at least I'm the right side of the advertised hour. Uh, I wonder if you can um, just send any messages of question on the chat box and I will um, answer them. If you don't, please don't worry, because it's quite a, a, an intensive session on rheumatoid arthritis. The slides will be available through uh, RELA. Um, and uh, from my point of view, I'm very happy to answer anything. So Linda says, thank you, enlightening and educational. Well, thank you very much, Linda. You see, I'll, I'll have done my job.